This is level two of the CFA program, topic four, financial reporting and analysis, and the reading on analysis of financial institutions. I'm guessing that at some point in your life, either you're going to feel compelled to do so, or your supervisor is going to ask you to evaluate a financial institution. So this reading could probably be called something that sounds like, let's take everything we know about evaluating a regular old brick and mortar manufacturing company and let's apply it to financial institutions. You'll see that as we look through the learning outcome statements. Describe how financial institutions differ from other com companies. I just said that, right? And so we're gonna look at some really important uh, components of that difference. Financial regulations, um, key ratios and requirements, some other factors, and then we'll spend a few slides looking at a specific financial institution, and that is um, an insurance company. So let's go ahead and do just a short recap of what we ought to know from level one about financial services. Uh, providers of basic f banking services, right? Commercial banks, credit unions, and other kinds of banking institutions. Uh, they operate as intermediaries, of course, hedge funds, one of my favorites, but mutual funds, I mean, those are all over the place, right? And as a broker, and then that last column over there is, uh, is the insurance industry. So look at the diamond point at the bottom there, main focus of this reading, banks and insurance companies. All right, so let's look at that very first LOS, describe how financial institutions differ from other companies. So distinctive features. All right, so let's go back to some examples that I've used in previous recordings. Remember remember that one example I gave you where I'm, uh, I'm Jim's construction company and I'm, gonna, I'm hired to build a bridge over the Susquehanna River. <clears throat> Well, if I fail, clearly that's not good news. And, you know, there's going to be unemployment inside of my company and it might have some impact on my supply chain. But it's not going to be such a tragedy that it will impact the entire economy. So distinctive, distinctive features of financial institutions primarily is their systemic importance. If I'm not Jim's construction company, if I'm Jim's bank and I fail, I may have a huge impact on the local economy, maybe the regional economy. And if Jim's bank is big enough and powerful enough, even the global economy. <clears throat> So look at that second teardrop point, systemic risk, the risk of disruption of the financial services due to, to, to failure of all or parts, right? I'm Jim's bank, I'm a part of it, or has a negative impact on the economy as a whole. And there's a good word down there, financial contagion. I first heard this in graduate school by one of my, uh, actually it was one of my econometrics professors who was doing some research on contagion in uh, in Latin America and how that how that uh, moved throughout the economy and it even hit some parts of the US economy so contagion of course is the word that is derived from contagious you know of course we're all worried about contagion and contagiousness in uh, with COVID and all that kind of stuff however let's just focus it in the uh, in the financial industry and so what that means what that means primarily is that um, we need to have some kind of a, of a body, of an umbrella looking over uh, the financial services industry, which means that it's probably going to be heavily regulated. So two things that come out of this slide, systemic importance, and then the consequence of that is that the government gets involved and it gets involved at some pretty high levels. Well, there we go. Teardrop point number one, heavy regulation due to systemic importance. All right, so what kind of regulations are we going to look at during this slide? The amount of capital that must be maintained, liquidity, and then constraints on risk taking. So those are really th three super important uh, types of regulations that we'll look at and that you should probably look for um, on, on an exam. 
All right, if we look at a regular old traditional company like uh, like Harley Davidson here in the United States, what do we know about Harley Davidson ha Davidson's assets? Well, they have, of course, current assets, but then down on the bottom left hand side of its balance sheet, it has long term assets. So those are things like the metal stamping machines that it uses to manufacture uh, motorcycles. Well, of course, financial institutions, they don't have metal stamping machines. They don't have uh, John Deere tractors like I do if I'm Jim's uh, construction company. If I'm Jim's bakery, I have ovens and all sorts of conveyor belts to make my donuts and my cookies. So financial institutions on the asset side of its balance sheet has things like loans, right? A mortgage loan to Jim, a car loan to Jim, a personal loan to Jim, and everybody else. So there's consumer loans and then there are commercial loans. And then, of course, financial institutions can invest in the securities issued by other companies and uh, and governments as well. All right, those financial assets ought to be recognized at fair value. We've heard that uh, over the last couple of readings regarding um, financial statement analysis, right? So, and those financial assets are exposed to all the risk that we talked about back in level one, and we'll continue talking about those in level two and in level three, market risk, liquidity risk, interest rate risk. Now, what's really gonna be interesting from a financial institution perspective is that interest rate risk, you know, may be the primary risk for this industry. I remember learning about this when I, my very first graduate class <clears throat> in my master's program, uh, my professor, who's still teaching there, um, he told us that financial institutions are those <clears throat> institutions that accept deposits and make loans. <laughs> and that there are two different interest rates on the left-hand side of the balance sheet and the right-hand side of the balance sheet. And so I've always approached financial institutions from that simple perspective, which makes interest rate risk super important. All right, how about the right-hand side of the balance sheet? Liabilities over there. What are the liabilities for a company like Harley-Davidson, right? You know, accounts payable and notes payable and bonds payable, all that kind of stuff. Those are sources of capital. But for a financial institution, uh, primarily they're made up of deposits. And the most fascinating thing about this simple fact <clears throat> from a risk management perspective is that I could, I could hit the lottery and go down and deposit my capital, my cash in the bank, and then I could change my mind an hour later and, and go make that withdrawal. And so deposits are super, super short term, and the bank managers have to manage that short termness on the top right of the balance sheet as it relates to the rest of the balance sheet on the right-hand side and then how it relates over to the left-hand side of the balance sheet. All right, look at that second teardrop point. I always think of the picture that I looked at in my very first finance textbook as an undergraduate back in 1981. Oh my gosh, were any of you even born in 1981? And there was a picture of a bank in New York City in which there was a run on the bank and there were people lined up. They actually were lined up around the entire block to get their, to get their cash. Of course, this was in 1930 or 1931, whatever. <clears throat> So the problem with a run on a bank is that it has the potential to negatively impact the entire economy and that might lead to financial contagion. So think of it as the dominoes, right? So one domino falls, it causes the next domino, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then look at the last teardrop point there <clears throat> as it relates to government intervention. So what happens is that banks will ensure up to a certain limit of deposits. And of course, that comes from government support. Now, of course, each country has its own set of rules and laws and regulations for banking supervision. But then there are bodies out there that kind of look at this from a global perspective. And this is uh, this is the Bank for International Settlements. This, of course, is the Basel Committee. 
which was created, uh, I believe, in 1974. And of course, the purpose of Basel was to regulate and evaluate and recommend all sorts of regulations for the banking industry. Now, there was a Basel one and a Basel two. Now there was a Basel three. I'm guessing that you're going to say, hey, Jim, I don't even need any of this information because I'm pretty sure there was a Basel back after the 2008 financial crisis. So this is Basel three. So what was the focus here? Minimum capital requirements, minimum liquidity requirements and stable funding requirements. So what does that sound like? It sounds an awful lot like parents up here, right? And here are all of the children, parents saying to their children, all right, you shouldn't have cookies before you go to bed. You should have a balanced meal. You should have, you know, good friends who are going to help you study and, uh, and succeed in life and all these kinds of things. So think of this, uh, this BIS as the parents who are saying, okay, the children who may or may not know what's best for themselves or the rest of their friends or the economy, we need to make some standards, right? So minimum, minimum and stable funding requirements. Now, what we're going to do is take a look at these individually, but just quickly here, you know, what's the problem with minimum capital requirements? So you think about the, the, right-hand side of the balance sheet for a financial institution. It has tons and tons of deposits and then tons and tons of medium and long-term liabilities. And then it has a small amount of capital. If it doesn't have that equity down there on the bottom right-hand side of the balance sheet to act as kind of a buffer, then if that top portion of the right-hand side of the balance sheet gets too high, well, then that's too much leverage, right? And what do we know about leverage? When, you know, there's beauty of leverage and then there's the ugliness of leverage. And then that leads to things like contagion. So notice what we've put on bolded over there on the right hand side to protect depositors. All right. Minimum liquidity requirements. Of course, we need to be liquid. We need to be able to turn some of our assets into cash to be able to meet those uh, incoming short-term liabilities. And then funding requirements, of course, whenever we have a need for cash, whenever a financial institution has a need for capital, it can just go over to its cash flow statement and say, oh, I've, I've got tons of cash right here, I'll just use that. <clears throat> However, that's not always the case. Sometimes we have to go to external markets, things like the bond market and the stock market, or just try to attract deposits. So stable funding requirements. All right, so um, this three accord has encouraged banks to focus on asset quality. Oh my gosh, I have to stop and say, can I get through a slide deck without being compelled to mention Medigliani and Miller from 1958? What did those two dudes tell us? They told us that the, the value of a company is based on the quality of its assets, its ability of those assets to generate sustainable operating cash flow. All right, so here we have the parents saying, look, Medigliani and Miller were right back in 1958. Let's focus on lending to high quality individuals and businesses and governments. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't want to take risk. We don't want to just lend to all the people who are going to be guaranteed to repay us. We need to lend to people who have some uncertainty about their ability to repay, but we need to make sure that we price that loan adequately. So look at that, that third circle point, improved risk assessment processes. And then the middle one is to hold capital, of course. All right, how about the LOS explain the camels? All right, so six components. We'll go ahead and do this. Capital adequacy, asset quality, management capabilities, earning sufficiency, liquidity position, and sensitivity to market risk. And what we're going to do is give them a star rating, right? Morning star. We always have star ratings for movies, right? You know, James Bond movies, they always get the five star. Maybe not. I always give them the five star rating. All right. So here, here, make sure you remember this. One is the best rating. Five is the worst rating.
All right, let's start with capital adequacy. So look at that ratio there. This is just a simple ratio that you probably learned back in kindergarten, or at least maybe your undergraduate days. Take our total equity capital over total assets. Now for financial institutions, that capital adequacy ratio is probably gonna be relatively small because there's so much in deposits and medium term liabilities over on the right hand side of the balance sheet. So one way we handle this is by not taking a look at just the total assets, but weight those assets, right? So notice in bold, we have risk weighted assets. So what we could do is just think like accountants and say, all right, we have 10 of this and 10 of this and 10 of this. So there's our total assets. That's that's 30. But if we assign a risk weighting to each of those, then we still are probably going to get what did I have 10 and 10 and 10 is 30. But we're going to have some kind of a different uh, weighting on each. And so look at the circles over on the right. So for cash, there's absolutely no risk for cash, right? Because because we have the cash. Corporate loans, that might be 100% or somewhere around 100%. And these are just kind of general guidelines here. Um, you know, what that means is that we would probably say, okay, 100%, uh, that just means that, all right, we have these corporate loans and, you know, uh, they'll probably be repaid. So let's assign them uh, a weighting of 100%. And then riskier assets, maybe a loan to, how about if I pick um, my, my twin sons? You know, if my twins went into the financial institution and say, hey, we need, uh, need $10,000 because we want to start our, uh, we want to start our own lawn cutting service. And the, uh, the loan manager is going to look at these two knuckleheads and say, OK, what do you have as collateral? And they'll say, oh, well, I have my dad back here. And the bank might say, well, is, is your dad coming in to sign anything? And they might say, well, no, he specifically said he wasn't going to sign anything. All right. So right. So the bank, you know, maybe it lends the money to my twins. Those are riskier assets. So we sign a weighting of greater than 100 percent. Now that might be what Jim says about his twins, but what about uh, what about Basel III? So look at this, we've got tier one capital, those are core assets, and we have tier two capital, which is considered to be some supplemental capital. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at that little box up in the top right. So let's start from the left. So Basel has decided that what we need is 8% of the risk weighted ca uh, assets, right? And so how is that broken up? It's broken up into 2% of tier two capital and then 6% of tier one capital, which has two components. So let's go ahead and look at those two components over on the left hand side. So common equity, tier one capital, this includes things that you would suggest, right? Common stock, retained earnings, and then some other stuff in there, deferred taxes and intangibles. Let me make a comment again. The Institute is not asking us to be able to put down the journal entry for recording deferred taxes. Just make sure that we know uh, what those things are and how they're handled from an accounting standpoint, you know, from, from a big picture uh, perspective. Other tier one capital subordinated securities without a fixed maturity nor any kind of contractual uh, cash flows, whether those are interest or dividends. So those must sum to 6%. And then you add the supplemental capital, which are subordinate securities that have longer term maturity. So remember these numbers here, right? The two, the one and a half, uh, and the four and a half, and that gets you up to a total of eight. How about the second one? Asset quality. This is uh, right out of Medigliani and Miller. It shows the amount of credit risk associated with financial assets of the bank. Loans, of course, are going to be uh, the largest component. And it depends on, of course, the borrower's credit worthiness. So let's go ahead and start with someone like me, right? I'm a nearly 60 year old college professor who has been teaching for a thousand years. So I have pretty stable income. I've owned my house for 20 years. You know, we don't owe any money on our cars, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm probably way up there where I'm a low risk. And then all the way at the bottom are my twins who want to borrow money for their lawn cutting business. And then there's everything in between. So the borrower's credit worthiness. So let me go ahead and make a comment here about credit risk. 
This is what I tell my students all the time about risk management. Three things, three components. We need to identify the risks, quantify the risks, and then manage the risk. And each one of those components has its own unique characteristics and its own unique mission and outcome. So borrower's credit worthiness. Of course, the problem back in 2008 is that I'm pretty sure that we didn't identify the risk. We clearly didn't quantify the risk. And then without the first two components, you can't manage the risk. And, and so all of these derivative securities and credit default swaps that are being blamed for the 2008 financial crisis uh, are not inherently bad themselves. It's the individuals who who made those poor decisions because they didn't follow uh, Jim's three rules. And then of course, there's going to be an allowance for expected loan losses. So what's, what's the expected loan loss for, for my loan? Uh, you know, it can't be zero because I guess I could die or get sick, right? So it's going to be some small number, but the allowance for my son's loan, especially if they miss the first payment because no one will hire them to cut the grass, um, then that's going to be substantially higher, right? Now, how about uh, investment in securities? This can be a substantial portion of the bank's assets. So here in the US, we're going to measure these at fair value. The international standards, we can choose between uh, fair value or amortized cost. Now, let's go ahead and come up with a good ratio for asset quality. So non-performing loans over total loans. So this is based on, look at the diamond points over there, the composition of the assets and the credit quality. So this credit quality, suppose that there are, the bank makes 100 loans to people just like me, right? 60-year-old uh, men and women who've had jobs their whole life, et cetera, et cetera. And we, you know, we've never defaulted on any of our loans. So what's the numerator in that thing going to be? Probably pretty low, right? But how about if the bank lends 100 to 100 people like my twins, those non-performing loans over time, that, that might be substantial. All right, how about management capabilities? And so let's go ahead and make sure you understand that we're switching from, you know, maybe a quantitative method up there. There's a ratio to, boy, what does this say? Highlights management's ability to identify, measure, monitor, and control risk. And so we'll probably use some kind of ratios, but they might be general, but we're going to have to give a sense of our skill set and being able to evaluate the capabilities of management. So how do we do this? We look at their internal controls, we look at their communication, and we look at the financial reporting. So we combine those three. We're gonna to have to make a judgment on that, and we may, we may use some ratios inside of each one of those, but we're gonna to have to make an adjustment so that we can make a determination. Look at that second big diamond point, right? Guarantees the growth and endurance of a bank. All right, how about earnings? So this is probably relatively similar to what we've talked about in the past. Think about this. We have the income statement. So we got revenues up here, expenses over here. So we have net profit or net income down at the bottom or net earnings. So what, what do we want to do to evaluate? So we do the same kinds of things. We want to take a look at the quality, the quantity, and the trend of earnings, right? We want them to be adequate and sustainable, and we're gonna call those high quality earnings. You know, adequate, what does that mean? Adequate means something like, okay, what are we doing in terms of being able to meet our weighted average cost of capital? Are we providing a return to the depositors and the bondholders and the shareholders, right? Adequate earnings. And then sustainable uh, simply means that, hey, we have a brand named bank and we have brand name services so that when someone thinks of a personal loan, they say, hey, Jim, I dealt with Jim before. What a great banker he is. I'm going back to him. So sustainable means, um, you know, I'm not quite sure I want to use the word stable here because we want to add some growth to it, but there's some stability in the uh capacity of a bank to sustain its earnings, right? What, what would we like to see? I mean, of course, we'd like to see something, you know, with a high slope, but we want to see something where we have a reasonable growth rate and those earnings are sustainable, which implies that uh, the bank doesn't have too many of those non-recurring events, 
Yeah, so look at that fourth diamond point. What does it tell us? Should be derived from recurring services. I'm sorry, recurring sources. All right, how about composition of earnings? So what does the bank do? Net, it, what did I say to you about my professors? You know, there's an interest rate on the left-hand side. There's an interest rate on the right-hand side. So net interest income and service income. You know, I remember in the old days, one of my professors in graduate school said, you know, that banks used to get most of their cash flow and earnings from generating interest. Um, however, uh, recently, you know, maybe the last 15 years or so, that about half of the bank's um, income comes from other things, you know, like fees and other kinds of services. Uh, how about trading income? Volatile. <laughs> if it's volatile, it's probably not sustainable. And that goes back to what I said about the recurring versus non-recurring items. Now, how about if we're going to try to value our securities that we hold on the left hand side of the balance sheet? Well, I mean, if I have if I have a uh, uh, thousand shares in Harley Davidson, it's super easy, right? All I got to do is type in a couple of ticker symbols on my computer and I have the price of Harley Davidson. So that's easy. But what happens? What happens if we hold securities that are not traded on an organized exchange or an over the counter market? So this is the fair value hierarchy framework. So notice there's level one, level two and level three. And so what would we like to do? What we would like to do is find another company that looks exactly like the company that we've invested, but this other company trades on the New York Stock Exchange. So quoted market prices of identical assets in active markets. So of course, it makes perfect sense to say something like, you know, this company that we invested in, it looks just like this company and here's the price history. All right, that makes sense. Um, how about level two inputs? Um, suppose that there are other ways to value a company, maybe through something like, you know, cash flow analysis or dividend or interest analysis, or maybe some uh, comparability analysis. So observable inputs other than quoted prices. So we have the company that we invested in, and here's another company that doesn't have direct New York Stock Exchange stock prices, but there's a lot of things over here that we can be that can be used uh, observable, right? Observable inputs that can be used to help value the company um, in which we have invested. And then let's go to the other extreme. Suppose that there are unobservable inputs. So we have a company here and there's no other companies that are over here that look anything like our company. So we need to figure this out, look at trend analysis, try to look at some kind of comparative analysis and maybe industry analysis to come up with you know, some kind of a measure, maybe it's historical volatility, maybe it's something else. So what we're trying to do here is just assign a value. And after all, this is what we do as financial analysts, right? We should take a look at, all right, it's no fun if I can just go over here and say, oh, this company trades on the exchange, I can just use that price, right? That's pretty simple. What we want to use our skill sets is to be able to do those level three inputs so we can figure this out. That's what I tell my students all the time. I tell my children all the time, figure it out. You're smart enough to figure it out. All right, how about a liquidity position? All right, it shows sources of liquidity and the fund management practices. All right, this is important. Look at that second circle point. Banks have systemic importance, so they have to have adequate liquidity. Oh my gosh, can I read that? At all times, not just sometimes, but at all times, because of course, of course, if a bank says, oh, I'll have adequate liquidity 97 and a half percent of the time, what's going to happen? You know, sooner or later, that two and a half percent of the time is going to be when there's a million people show up and say, hey, I want my money. You know, think of it this way. Uh, I love to tell stories about my, my children. And so when, when our daughter was born, if I had $100 in my, in my pocket, I, I felt pretty good about it. And, I, you know, 
when she, as she was growing up, she wanted to, you know, have dancing lessons and, and dribbling lessons for basketball and new shoes for school. You know, so I had a hundred bucks. So, I, you know, it was easy to fund that. Then our son was born. Right. So he wants golf lessons and then he wants basketball lessons. But he's also a little bit of an artist. So he wanted to do some drawing. So now my hundred dollars has to be split between my daughter and my son. So I felt OK about having a hundred dollars. But then our twins were born. So if I had a hundred dollars, uh, uh, boy, now the twins, they come out and who knows what the heck they've demanded from me over the last 16 years. But my hundred dollars, of course, doesn't go as far with four children as it did with one. So once again, the parent, right, uh, uh, the Basel three is saying, you know what, Jim, you need more than a hundred dollars. Maybe you now need, boy, do I need four hundred dollars or do I need just $300 or maybe $280. So that's what this uh, liquidity coverage ratio tells us. Highly liquid assets over expected cash outflow. So this is a cool ratio and think about what this means. All we're doing is saying, all right, what do we have on the top left of our balance sheet? And who do we have over here in the top right of the balance sheet who's going to come knocking on our door? Jim's financial institution. Hey, Jim, you owe me this money. So I have all these people coming and knocking on my door. And over here, I'm saying, all right, I have my $400 in cash or my $300 in cash, but I also have a bunch of treasury bills or double or triple A rated corporate securities or whatever those are. So that's what that liquidity coverage ratio tells us. And look at in bold red what we have in the bottom a minimum of a hundred percent that's from the Basel three all right how about the net stable funding ratio this is interesting so look in the numerator we have available stable funding divided by required stable funding and so the numerator is really a function of what goes on on the right hand side of the balance sheet right capital deposits and other liabilities the required stable funding is based however on the composition and the maturity and the stability of the bank's asset base so it's really it's really a ratio of short-term assets versus short-term liabilities and notice once again minimum of greater than 100 percent All right, how about the last one here? Sensitivity to market risks. Ah, bank earnings are most sensitive to market risks. Of course, you're not surprised to read that. Exposure to security prices, currency values, and interest rates. Boy, I should have put those interest rates over there in, in bolded red and flashing. You know, can you do that in a, in a PowerPoint slide? Flashing interest rate risk. Ah, ah, interest rate risk has the most significant impact. Now, why is that true? Because there are differences in maturity and rates and repricing frequency between assets and liabilities. Didn't we talk back in level one? I know we're going to do it in level two and level three about duration matching. Oh, that's a super fun exercise when we say something like, all right, we're borrowing the money over here and we have durations of three and five and 10 and 20. And so what are we going to invest in over here? Well, we need to do three and five and 10 and 20. I mean, it doesn't have to be a perfect match, of course, and there are all different kinds of strategies involved in duration matching. But this is all part of, what did I say earlier? All right, identifying the risk. So here we're, <clears throat> we're identifying this as market risks. We're going to quantify the risk by doing something like, oh, how about scenario analysis? Look at that fourth diamond point down there. How about scenario analysis? I love looking at an Excel spreadsheet where we have all these different variables and we have one output, whatever that output is. Maybe it's net present value, maybe it's cash flow. Um, and then we change each one of those and recompute and recompute. And we can get all the way up to a Monte Carlo simulation, but we'll also do things like value at risk. So what was I saying? We're identifying the market risk. We're quantifying here. We use the word measure here and then uh, and then we're going to uh, manage that risk. And that's in with uh, duration duration matching. All right. How about limitations? This is probably a good uh, <clears throat> this is probably a good exam question. So I would just memorize those three words. Uh, indeterminacy, subjectivity, and inconsistency. So what have I said to you a couple of times here in these last handful of slides is that 
you know, we're going to use ratios and, and no matter the financial analyst, we're going to come up with the same ratio, right? But then evaluating and interpreting that ratio based on trend analysis or comparisons means that, you know, there's going to be some opinion. Of course, it's an educated opinion. It's one based on experience and skill. But nevertheless, two financial analysts could look at the same financial institution and arrive at different conclusions, which then leads to uh, inconsistency. <clears throat> now this camel's approach, look at that second diamond point, uh, failed to recognize weaknesses in banks before a crisis. And that's probably mostly because of the first one of the identifying the risk and identifying the risk is much more than just saying, oh, we're exposed to market risk. We need to go like this. We need to go like that. What is market risk? Do the whole, whole breadth and then we need to do the depth and then, of course, what if I'm Jim's bank and I fail and all of my depositors think, OK, I'm not getting my money. All of my bondholders think, OK, I'm not getting my money. All my shareholders think, OK, I'm not getting my money. But then the, cover, the government comes in and said, you know what, Jim, it wasn't really your fault. Uh, here's 20 billion dollars. Have a nice day. All right. Other factors to consider. There we go. Government support. Larger banks are more likely to receive government support. Government ownership, which applies to lots of countries throughout the world, but uh, most likely not uh, uh, the largest economies in the world. Uh, describe these other factors. Okay, it has to depend on the mission. So community banks, right, focused on the community. Global banks, you know, are all over the place. And they have uh, probably a well diversified asset base, which is a little bit different than a community banks, which probably have a concentration. And so one of the goals of a community bank is to seek ways to diversify, right? It can't it can't diversify inside of its local geographic region, but there are other ways uh, of diversifying. And then, of course, uh, this corporate culture, in particular, the risk culture is extremely important. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, a chief risk officer now. And so this individual has to wake up every morning and think about risk, right? And then ways to identify and quantify and manage risk. And this is all that this individual does throughout the day. And what's important from a corporate culture perspective is that this individual then permeates that thought process throughout the financial institution. Now, that, of course, means, you know, in the old days, I'm talking about pre-COVID, in the old days, it means for the chief risk officer to go out and visit with all the branches and say, hey, are you thinking about risk today? What risk are you exposed to right now? In other words, how about if I give you a scenario? Suppose 100 people show up and they say, hey, we want our money back right now out of our deposits. Are you ready to handle that? risk. Or suppose 100 people show up and they all hit the lottery and they say, hey, we want to make this deposit. Are you ready to handle that? So here's the thing. This risk culture, as it applies to the entire corporate culture, is super important. What the reading talks about is the difference between, you know, conservative and a risk seeking culture, probably uh, uh, seeking different kinds of goals. So look at the bottom one. Balance is the key. Of course, it's perfectly acceptable and in fact preferable by shareholders of a financial institution to find risky assets. Of course, those risky assets are going to generate higher expected returns. However, we don't want to ignore our conservative people like me, right? Jim, 69, 60 years old, who probably is going to provide a return that can meet our weighted average cost of capital. So look at the bottom right there. Balance is the key. That sounds an awful lot like a great exam question where you have a, in the vignette a description of a financial institution that's doing a bunch of stuff, whether it's uh, risk avoiding or risk seeking. And then the question is going to say, what would you recommend? And the recommendation would be just, well, it's OK to do this stuff up here, but let's go ahead and counterbalance it with some other pursuit. Balance is the key. I think I tell you guys regularly, I have a really great colleague who teaches stats classes and supply chain classes, and he talks about the importance of the environmental scan, scanning the environment. So this is what I think about here. 
uh, competitive environment, so regional, national, global, how it affects a bank, and how, how the industry globally allocates capital and assesses risk. And then, of course, we need to make sure that we're aware that um, we can hide actual debt from a bank. You can't help but think of the Enron with its uh, special purpose vehicles and variable interest uh, entities are, you know, they're kind of a subcategory of there. And so what do they throw? What do banks throw into these special vehicles? You know, they throw all sorts of things. Uh, like operating leases and some assets. And then then they use those assets to issue a bond and then that bond doesn't show up on the balance sheet. That's why it's called, of course, off balance sheet items. So let's make sure we're aware of those things and the consequences of them. I'm not saying that these things are inherently bad. No, they have their uses, of course they do, but we need to just be able to make sure that we know about them. Here's one of my favorite slides in this whole slide deck. There we go, JP Morgan Chase. Notice that it has different kinds of segments. I always think of these as silos. So there's investment banking silo, there's card services, there's treasury services, right? There's six of them. So what I want you guys to do is envision that you are, are there six of you out here watching this? Geez, I hope there's at least six people out there, but let's just suppose there's six of you watching this. And so each of you is, uh, is the manager for each one of these segments or silos. And I'm your supervisor. And so what do I do? I come to you every day and I say something like, hey, I want you to identify, quantify, and manage the risks inside of your silo. And I want you to be able to generate enough cash flow to meet our weighted average cost of capital, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so your job is to manage each of those silos, right? What is my job? My job is to make certain that I am aware of, you ready for this? The correlation coefficient, the, the copula relationship between and among each of those silos. So I know which successful business practice in one silo adds or subtracts value into the success or failure of another silo. And then it's my job to convince you that while you're managing, your primary job is to manage that silo, right, as a segment, maximize shareholder wealth, but your secondary, your tertiary job is to be aware of the relationships that your business has, that your segment has with each of those other, that others, that way, that way, these six silos then can kind of merge into one unit of a successful financial institution. Now, what does that mean for us as good financial analysts trying to evaluate JP Morgan Chase? Well, we want to see the performance of each one of those segments. And we can look at financial ratios. We can go back to the camels. We can do all that stuff for each one of those silos and then make a judgment on each segment. And then we can say, hey, you know what? And I'm just making this up here. JP Morgan Chase is excellent at those first four silos. It is adequate at the fifth silo and it stinks at the sixth silo. I'm making that up again, right? So then as a financial analyst, we can use that information to be able to make a much better determination on whether or not we think that JP Morgan Chase is undervalued or overvalued or fairly valued. Uh, how about some other factors here? Of course, currency exposure, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, risk factors, when you, when you look at uh, financial institutions and your report or it's 10K or some other financial statements, there'll be some notes in there, there'll be some management discussion in there, and somewhere there'll be a list of all the factors and all the risk factors. And of course, there'll be market risk and there'll be interest rate risk. And there'll be all different sorts of risk. And so it's important to read those so that you can get a sense of what management thinks are those risk factors. And then what's important, you know, kind of uh, uh, by construction with important to the, the board of directors. And then, of course, there are disclosures that are required by the BIS minimum risk-based capital requirements, and then useful regulatory information. And so in these disclosures, you're going to read something that sounds like, hey, we're aware of all these recommendations, and here's how we've handled them. 
right, how about if we take a simple analysis of a bank? So there are some capital ratios for ABC Bank. Uh, let's see, tier one, total tier one, and then total capital ratio. And then let's go ahead. Well, when you're given a table on uh, in a vignette and it has multiple years, you're almost guaranteed to make a judgment on what's happening over time. So think trend analysis and boy, make sure that you're aware of which order that goes. I mean, the way my brain works, a lot of times I transpose things. So look, there's 2020. So that's the most recent year. And then 2019 and 2018, because that'll, you know, I would switch those and I would get the answer completely wrong. So what do you see here going back to 2018, as you just casually move your eyes over, you see, oh, well, there's the obvious notion that those ratios are declining, right? So there we go. There's the dis decreasing there. And so what that tells us is that there's a weakening of the capital position from 2018 to 2020. However, they meet those minimum recommended levels specified uh, in that three framework. All right, so is this a concern? Well, absolutely. But then what we need to make sure we understand is that, all right, those minimum recommended levels are, are being met. However, there's a weakening in capital position. Let's go ahead and open up the hood and see why. Why have these uh, Why have these fallen? And part B, should we be concerned? And the answer might be, oh, it's perfectly acceptable for these to be decreasing. In fact, I'm surprised they're not decreasing even a little bit more. Boy, there's a great conclusion. That's probably an indication of a financial institution that's doing all those three things properly. All right, how about asset composition? So let's look down, there's 2020 and 2019. So the way my eyes work, I'm looking at this table in a vignette, I'm just gonna skip to the bottom and say, all right, 1.1, 1.3, so total assets are increasing. So the question is, has liquidity position improved? Well, total assets going up is one thing. Let's go to our liquid assets. And so look up at the top. There are liquid, so 233 to 240. So they have gone up. But what we probably want to do is we probably want to do a ratio. We don't want to do absolute values. So liquid assets as a percentage of total assets used to be almost 20. Right now it's close to 18. So this has declined, indicating declining liquidity. And so once again, this may or may not be problematic. It might be, hey, this is just the way the market has gone, uh, but we're still OK. All right, how about part three of this, a loan loss profile? So let's see, allowance for consumer and commercial loans, right? And then provision for uh, uh, charge offs there. So we go. 437 to 440. So there's one that's probably about the same, right? It goes up a little bit. 254 to 141. Boy, that's a big drop. Then 47 to 88. That's a big increase. 102 to 90. All right. So we've got this table. And as we look at those numbers, we're thinking, okay, uh, boy, we're getting some mixed signals in there. So there are the mixed signals, the different colors, right on the right hand side. And so we have, boy, we've put in pink there to indicate you know, that's probably not much of a difference there. But look at the, the two reds for declining and the green for improving here. And so look at the last teardrop point. Implies that the cushion between the allowance and the net commercial loan charge off has deteriorated. That makes perfect sense, right? All right, let's go ahead and switch gears over to insurance companies. All right, so what do insurance companies do? Well, it's pretty similar to what a financial institution does, right? Accepts deposits and make loan makes loans. So it's going to have a it's going to have a difference in those interest rates. But insurance companies, what do they do? They collect premiums and they pay out claims. All right, so their earned revenue is uh, the float between the premiums and the income earned. And that float, of course, depends on timing here, right? Because whether, I look at the bottom two categories, so property and casual or life and health insurance. So, you know, I'm guessing that uh, we all have those kinds of insurance. And so just think about it. You know, we, my wife and I have lived in three homes during our 300 years of marriage. Actually, it's only 30, but, you know, we've never had a claim on our home. 
Now, I don't know how many cars we've had in the 30 years of our marriage, um, and we've only had one claim on our, our car. Uh, that was different once we had children driving, but, you know, my wife and I, but then life and health are, of course, both of us are still alive, but we have all of these health issues over the years. So that float depends on whether we're in the blue category or the red category. All right. How about a business profile? Um, buildings, autos, environmental damage, that's property, right? Casualty is liability. All right, so what do we need to cons uh, to focus on here? Direct mar marketing or agency writing? So this is the source of our source of our revenue generating ability and our ability to generate cash flows. Now, how about earnings characteristics here? Highly sensitive to price, right? This industry is super competitive, and of course, it became super, super, super competitive when uh, everyone started buying home computers back in the late 1990s and you could just type in, hey, uh, my car, my insurance payment, my insurance premium every year is $10,000. Is anyone out there cheaper? And you would get a flood of emails saying, oh, we'll do it for 6,000 or 5,000 or 4,000. So very competitive, also cyclical, cyclical in nature. And so let's go ahead and look at this important ratio, a combined ratio, total insurance expenses over net premiums. And so what we're looking looking at there is that if this combined ratio is exceeds 100%, this is probably bad news. So if we're looking for something that's less than 100%. Now, if we have a low combined ratio, like let's say 50% or 70%, what that means is that we're doing something really well. So we're going to attract the comp co competition. People are going to say, oh, Jim, he's no better than I am. Jim's insurance company. I can do everything that Jim can do. So there's this competition. They come in and they offer lower prices. So people leave me, they go over there and I'm losing all these customers. So I'm saying maybe I'm charging too high a price. So reduce premiums. And what that does is, uh, is leads to a higher combined ratio. So let me just go back here just pretty quickly just to show you that ratio and then to remind you to look at that third circle point there, cyclical in nature, and that's what this uh, slide describes. All right, how about key profitability ratio? So loss and loss adjustment expense ratio. All right, so look at the denominator there. Net premiums earned. So we got all this cash flow coming in, loss expense and a loss adjustment expense. Of course, what do we want? We want we want low numerator and lots of denominators. So the lower the ratio, the higher the success um, for the insurance company. How about an underwriting expense ratio? So this is net premiums written over, uh, in the denominator and underwriting expense in the numerator. So we want this number to be low as well. And this one's going to tell us something about the efficiency um, in being able to obtain new new premiums. And so remember that denominator is the net premium written. So that's a new premium. Now, how about if we look at this combined ratio as a combination of the loss and loss adjustment expense ratio plus the underwriting expense ratio. So this is a measure of general efficiency. And once again, we want this to be less than 100%. Uh, how about dividends? So what are we doing here? Dividends to policyholders and over net premiums earned. So the higher this ratio, this is greater liquidity. That's probably something to remember. But then let's suppose that we um, let's suppose that we add this dividend ratio to our combined ratio. So let's call it combined ratio after dividends, which is our combined ratio plus the ratio that we just described there. Uh, investment returns. Let's look at uh, total investment income in the numerator over investment assets. So what are we wanting there? Well, of course, of course, we'd like to have that to be 40 percent or 80 percent, but it's probably not going to probably not going to be because of things like duration and risk management. And so what we want is to be aware that low risk investments, they probably generate steady returns. So there's probably not lots of volatility in there. 
Uh, liquidity, uncertain payments, uh, demand for high liquidity, of course, should invest in highly liquid securities. That makes perfect sense. All right, how about switching over to life and health? So we've got uh, life and health insurance, investment products and services. So what are the sources of revenue? Premiums, investment products, investment returns, and then uh, the writing. Major components of the expense are the benefit payments, the annuity contract payments, and the surrender expenses. Yeah, look at the purple uh, box we have written down there. Accounting treatment of different items can distort earnings. You know, there's a whole reading out there on the quality of earnings. So my recommendation is for you to go ahead and review all the stuff that we talked about regarding massaging and manipulating uh, earnings and then relate it over here to life and health. Uh, profitability measures, these are things that we've uh, come across clearly back in level one, um, and these are um, applicable here to insurance companies as well. Investment returns, boy, what are we doing? Investment income over invested assets. So that's just some kind of a general return on investment. Uh, notice the third circle point, interest rate risk measures the duration gap between assets and liabilities. So duration management applies here to insurance companies, maybe even more so than in any other financial institution. Uh, liquidity is driven by liabilities. Sources of liquidity, cash flow, of course, always first cash flow, and then the investment in liquid assets. Uh, no global risk-based capital standards um, for insurance companies. Remember that, especially here in the United States, that each state has its own rules and regulations for insurance companies. So local authority, so let's not even limit it to the United States. So whatever that local authority is globally, they impose, they can impose and probably do minimum capital requirements. Um, yeah, lower capital requirements than P and C, of course, as their claims are more predictable. And that takes us through. So think of this as kind of a dual learning outcome statement summary, financial institutions. We spent way majority of our time on that and then insurance companies. So, you know, if I'm if I'm writing a vignette here for for this particular reading and I were to be required to write six questions, I'd have the vignette and then I'd have four, maybe five questions on financial institutions and then maybe something about an insurance company down here.